Uh, let's start talking about Donald Trump's record and uh, what he promised on in his 2016 campaign. Uh, again, I apologize if uh, there's a lot of reading. I will try not to sound like I'm reading. Uh, but the show notes prepared by Sam are great, and you can find these at wearelibertarians.com in the uh, the show notes uh, section. There's a PDF that you can download and refer back when you're talking with your friends about Biden, Kamala, and uh, Trump. Probably won't get into Pence because he's a known quantity. We've done shows on Mike Pence before. You can go back and, and look for those. Um, so campaign promises and what he ran on. In a 2015 speech, declaring his run for the presidency trump proclaimed we are going to make the country great again and that is the fundamental premise of the donald trump presidency uh he said sadly the american dream is dead but if i get elected president i will bring it back bigger better and stronger than ever before uh he said our country needs a truly great leader and we need a truly great leader now we need a leader that wrote the art of the deal we need a leader that can bring back our jobs, can bring back our manufacturing, can bring back our military, and take care of our vets. So those were the fundamental premises that Donald Trump ran on, in, according to Donald Trump. Uh, he was going to build a wall and make Mexico pay for it. Trump announced his candidacy with the promise to build a wall on a southern border. I would build a great wall. And nobody builds walls better than me. Believe me. And I'll build it... I'll build them very inexpensively. I will build a great, great wall on our southern border, and I will have Mexico pay for that wall. <laughs> back, you just go. I remember him saying that and laughing. Yeah. <laughs> back then, I thought he was funny. I don't think he's as funny anymore. Yeah. He's as he has become more petty and like a gourd bull fighting for his existence. He has become far less entertaining. Well. Um, when he has the power of the state, it, you know, the, it's not funny anymore when you have that much power and you can actually do stuff. It's that's not right. funny. <laughs> uh, he would temporarily ban Muslims from entering the United States. Following the December 2015 shooting in San Bernardino, Trump called for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what's going on. Uh, in May of 2016, Trump told the New York Times the ban would be in place by the end of his first 100 days. Uh, he said he would bring back manufacturing. Trump said he would revitalize manufacturing in various iterations. Quote, I'm going to withdraw from the United States from the Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership, and I'm going to tell our NAFTA partners I intend to immediately renegotiate the terms of that agreement and get a better deal for our workers. I will use every law presidential power, every lawful presidential power to remedy trade disputes, including the application of tariffs. Impose tariffs on goods made in China and Mexico. Renegotiate or withdrawal from NAFTA and the TPP. A full repeal of Obamacare was promised, and he would replace it with a market-based system. I would do things very quickly, and I would repeal and replace the big lie, Obamacare. He wanted to fully repeal Obamacare and replace it with health savings accounts, the ability to purchase health insurance across state lines, and let states manage Medicaid funds. Uh, he wanted to renegotiate the Iran nuclear deal. I will stop Iran from getting nuclear weapons. Cut taxes, both income and corporate. An economic plan designed to grow the economy 4% per year and create at least 25 million new jobs through massive tax cut reductions and simplification. Remember the postcard? He was going to put your taxes on a postcard. In combination with trade reform, regulatory relief, and lifting restrictions on American energy. The largest tax reductions are for the middle class, he said. A middle class family with two children would get a 35% tax cut the current number of brackets will be reduced from seven to three. That's one of that's what he promised early on in his campaign. And he was going to lower the business rate, the corporate tax rate from 35 to 15%. He was also going to defeat ISIS. Now, he released something called the contract with the American voter. 
On October 22nd, 2016, he issued what he called his contract with the American voter. It was a specific plan of action that would guide his administration starting from the first day, and he listed 60 promises in it. Now, in our show notes in this PDF, you can go read the whole document. It's there. We're just going to highlight some of these pieces. And uh, start, uh, let's, so we'll, we'll pick apart his record once we get to the first 100 days. But I just want to give you an idea of what Donald Trump promised. Um, six measures to clean up the corruption and special interest collusion in Washington, D.C., uh, propose a constitutional amendment to impose term limits on all members of Congress, a hiring freeze on all federal employees to reduce the federal workforce through attrition, exempting the military, public safety, and public health, a requirement that for every new federal regulation, two existing regulations must be eliminated, a five-year ban on White House and congressional officials becoming lobbyists after they leave government service, a complete ban on foreign lobbyists raising money for American elections, and seven actions to protect the American worker. I will announce my intentions to renegotiate NAFTA or withdraw from the deal. I will announce our withdrawals from the TPP, and I will direct the Secretary of the Treasury to label China a currency manipulator. Now, he also had five actions to restore security in the constitutional rule of law. Cancel every unconstitutional executive action memorandum and order issued by Obama. Cancel all federal funding to sanctuary cities and begin removing the more than 2 million criminal immigrants from the country and cancel visas to foreign countries that won't take them back. Uh, and again, to go in depth. Uh, now, you guys, that there's a lot in there that libertarians like, like cutting taxes. Uh, a lot of libertarians are for term limits. Uh, obviously, restoring constitutional order a lot of that stuff sounds really good so why do you guys why did you hate donald trump i'm just kidding <laughs> right i mean is that partly why you were so um uh, like for me you hear that stuff you hear that rhetoric and you go oh well yeah i'm, I'm for all that stuff reinhold uh some of it yeah um a lot of it if that's had been something i mean like the the muslim ban i'm not a big fan of obviously or some of the other things he was talking about in there, but as far as the, you know, the regulations and the term limits and the, uh, the tax cuts, as long as you're cutting spending at the same time, then those are things that we could look at and, and see some sort of win with as a, as a libertarian to say, at least we're getting some of our uh, concerns taken care of. It's just that uh, none of that ever really happened. Right. Yeah. <laughs> As we will get to, Harry. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's and the and some, but the, a lot of the things he didn't happen is either because he was either blocked by doing it, or said he couldn't do it, or he re, he found out really quickly that when he learned what the job of the president was, that he didn't have the ability to do that. You know? Well, he's completely, and it goes back to my point about civic education. He's completely unaware of how the government he op, he controls operates. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a big part of when you buy into the populism and you you make declarative statements based on what you think ought to be right. Um, mm -hmm. It is often or or if you're a pure ideologue, that is often met with the buzzsaw of uh, cooperation and collaboration that is required in Congress or required in any government body. You know, that's it's Dave said that to me on, on our interviews, like, you know, I didn't get criticized by libertarians until i joined the libertarian party well yeah once you enter into direct action politics you now have to cooperate with other people and they have different views and different opinions and there's different coalitions and there's a 40-year history of activism and many of those people are still there like they're there you have to give and take and so you know trump going in is not willing to listen to any other perspectives he is not willing to uh, negotiate, you know, and you'd think that the great deal maker would have been more apt to to have some of those conversations. But I think he thinks that he can just this is a problem with a lot of narcissists. He thinks he can just win through brute force and his Twitter account and and harassing the other side and making fun of them. And like, sure, that's that that works for a while. But eventually people start shedding off of that because they're exhausted. 
and he is he is he is exhausting the Republican Party and he wears them down. He wears everybody down. But the the, the I mean, the idea that he's he's diminished the left as president and we need four more years of this. We've gone from Bernie Sanders being an also ran against Hillary Clinton to being the heart and soul of the Democratic Party to Antifa being a weird group that threw milkshakes at Richard Spencer to being something that is occupying cities like he ain't the great fighter of the left. You know, it's it, this this ain't this ain't it, dude. Uh, so- he came in with he came in with no political capital. Right. He, and he came in thinking he was going to throw his weight around. And he and he also came in with a Republican Congress and a Republican Senate. So he had full reign as a party, if he had played party politics, as it were, to to get all of this stuff done. Because this is what the people who were in those positions wanted. They wanted to end to Obamacare. They wanted the, you know, a, a lot of the stuff that he was pushing for, right? So the fact that he couldn't get that done makes me wonder what's he going to do, you know, now that he doesn't have, you know, so, well, so two years had- later he doesn't have that anymore. He doesn't yeah. even have the power that he had. What's he going to have next time? Because it looks like they may be losing the Senate now because of him. Which is insane. I mean, yeah. when I remember the 2018 after like, yeah, but they're probably going to keep the Senate next time. They got 23 seats up. It's in all these favorable states like they were going to keep the Senate by two or three or four seats uh, as predicted at, after the last blue wave. Yeah. And they're going to lose all of it. The only one they are going to win is in Alabama. And that's a toss up. Yeah. And, and that still amazes that. me because Doug Jones is such a, a hero to so many people on the left down there that I cannot believe that that turnout isn't still going to be higher than what, you know, he may win like Trump won with just the turnout. He put the people who did the Birmingham uh, church bombing in jail. So that's why he's a hero. Um, So very loved. You're exactly exactly right, Harry. The the reality of politics is compromise. Right. And it's any, unwilling to that unwilling to work with them uh, especially even with the uh, republicans that's the other reason but the problem is uh rhino was talking about is playing poly, uh, party politics he wanted to do it his way those two years so he had the two years ability to do what he wanted and he didn't want to play ball with them he wanted to do it his way which they quickly realized which i'm sure a lot of the republicans realized that they just elected a democrat as a republican president um the other thing with i don't also Trump also had the issue of just trying to get his people in place, of just trying to get um, his people in uh, positions of power um, that he wanted to just to he, he got hit with roadblock after roadblock after roadblock of just trying to get his people in and Obama people's out during the transition process. Um, the regard, a uh, lot of it is the Obama era people were not uh, were very hesitant of the, of the uh, to the transition team and. That is also another reason why his 100 days was also kind of sabotaged. So it's, I'm not, it sounds like I'm giving, I'm, I'm not trying to like, make, I'm not making excuses for the guy. It's just more of a, this is also kind of what happened. Uh, if he does win re-election, there's a lot of that he doesn't have to do again, but he's still going to, it. but not having the Senate, not having Congress, it's, it's going to be the almost some like the second half of Obama's presidency when the, you know, it was just a bunch of stalemates and just the party of no. And it's this right now. That's what to me. It feels like this very weird aspect of the Republican party. Is this how the Democrats were? Uh, was it a 2000 and was it? yeah. 2012. 13, 12, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. They, it's slightly different, um, but it's, they're in this massive lull uh and it's i gotta put it it's i don't know what i'm looking for it's what i'm mostly worried is because the way obama governed that second half since he couldn't get anything in congress was all through just the power of the pen just having and, ridiculous and, executive orders and, and he's didn't been he that he say that if uh or it was leaked somewhere that Trump said that in his second term, it would be all the pen and the phone. And he was going to do a lot of, he was going to, the, the, the thing about a president's second term is it's always the B and C team. Mm-hmm. You, you come in with your A team, right? you know, you come in with your best people. And then just the, the nature of presidential politics is it wears people out and they drop off. Mm-hmm. Trump is like at the end of his first term with like his 
E and F team. So not only knows who is going to be at the end of this, the read right. Michael Lewis's fifth risk about the way that Donald Trump didn't staff the federal government with his people mm-hmm. in the beginning. And through attrition and retirements and, and a lack of recruitment, Trump has never replaced those people. And mm-hmm. what happens at the end of that second term is even more vacancies. I think like 25% of the federal government was never filled by Trump. You know, let's say it's 30%, 40% at the end of the second term, and you elect a Democratic president. Instead of 25%, you now have 40% for Barack Obama or, or, or Joe Biden, same difference, yeah. to fill out their people, right? Yeah. So you actually don't end up winning control of the bureaucracy with Donald Trump if he gets reelected. You're going to lose it. And that's another one of those inconsistencies in terms of Donald Trump, because he's an, a dysfunctional person who doesn't know the bureaucracy he's trying to manage, that's one of those unintended consequences of electing Trump is that the bureaucracy is going to become more liberal, more progressive, because it will be filled with more progressives. Like, and, and, and libertarians will often, and this was just with the post office stuff, libertarians will often go, well, I think it's good that the post office is being destroyed. I think it's good that this is being done this way i think it's it's not good because it it if elimination is your goal if if abolition of these various programs is your goal it needs to be done in a systematic way to avoid disturbances backlash. right like right, yeah disturbance and, of back, and backlash it you know like libertarian chief todd hagopian tweeted out like Hey, my son's medication is now late and his life is at risk because of the the cuts at the post office. Right. That's a totally avoidable human cost mm-hmm. if there is a plan to transition this stuff. Yep. Right? Like and and convince people that's part of democracy, that's part of a republic, that's part of any governmental system. That was my argument with the Confederate statues. Don't just go tear it down. The reason we have a representative democracy is that there's no there's less backlash and less resentment and less consequences on the other side if everybody feels that their voice is heard through the representative democratic democratic process. And when you just do things willy nilly and tear them down because it feels good, whether it's the post office or Confederate statues, it builds resentment. And then when the other guy gets in power, they act on that resentment instead of having the conversation and the the way that the system is supposed to work and so go ahead harry uh, uh yeah the one thing because you know, you're right phasing out the post office is something that you can do if you just open allow the other shipping companies or other shipping companies to be able to do what the post office does and then also allowing post office to charge a fair rate and yeah. they have already stated like you know we can't ship saturday to sundays with these rate without without a rate hike you know, and with Amazon doing their own shipping, that which Amazon is doing at a loss, they are losing money doing their own shipping, but they're able to afford that. And but they're taking money out of the USPS because it's not being shipped through USPS, it's being shipped to their own people. It's so that's another thing. That's another uh, so, but doing things like that, that's how you naturally uh, you allow companies to do that. That's how you naturally get rid of the post office or just like make it so the post office just does government mail and you allow everything else like that. This is just the mail thing that, that the government uses to ship out government necessary mail and you let everything else do it. Yeah, the mail. The, there's a monopoly on the mail by a diktat of Congress. It's, it says in the con- uh, Constitution that. You can have a mail service, a post office. You don't need one. Right. Um, you must not uh, must not have one. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, they could also, in 2006, they passed a rule where they had to contribute massive amounts of money to a pension fund. Right. You take that, you have Congress remove that right now. The Democrats could solve that problem. They could pass that mm-hmm. bill in the House right now. The Democrat, the Republicans would probably pass it in the Senate. The, you know, Trump probably wouldn't sign it, but if he doesn't sign it, you could probably get two thirds based on outrage. Right. You could fund the post office right now by removing that. Right. Uh, so but those are some of those bills that uh, the deep, the, the Enron is still affecting our economics today. Till this day, those, those are bills from Enron upset, the Enron upset. Yes. So, Enron. Well, it's, it's like I always said too. I said, if you want to get rid of the deep state, 
Trump was the worst person in the world to, to achieve that, even if that was actually one of his goals, which I don't think it really was. Um, other than the fact he just wanted everybody to be loyal to him, not to necessarily to the country. Right. So he wanted a, a loyalty test for everybody who worked for him. But um, the problem is, is that you get somebody like Trump in there who is doing corrupt things and doing all these things that starts to scare people they're going to be more apt to say we need those swamp people in there to keep the government protected from itself right to, to have somebody in there as a blocker to some of the more egregious things that he's trying to do you end up making the case for keeping the swamp with somebody like him now if you had somebody who went in there and played by all the rules and was squeaky clean and and worked to actually dismantle that environment there's no backlash because they're doing it the right way he's doing it the wrong way right yeah political science is called political science because there are predictable rules and just because you don't like the rules or the predictable trade-offs that come with government you can't just deny that those exist and say this is how it ought to be i've decreed it there are rules to bureaucracy which is why you want less of it because if people are trading and cooperating through private means and choosing who they're working with, even down to choosing what police departments to work with. Well, this police department seems a little racist and that doesn't reflect our values. So let's hire this other policing company. It, it then reduces the resentment because in a private policing situation, now all of a sudden you have choices. You can take your anger out on those people by firing them instead of spending 40 years marching in the streets screaming, this police department is racist and I don't like them. And they look at you and go, we're going to take your money by force. And if you protest too hard, we're going to lock you up. And you know what you can do about your criticisms? You can eat a dick. Because that's what government ultimately says is eat a dick. Libertarians are the only people that want to leave you alone. If you give libertarians power, we're going to leave you alone. The other two sides are not for that. They don't, they're not offering that.